that have been part of our Future Materials Innovators Program. This is a new program that we brought this institute to launch uh, in the spring. And it's uh, entirely dedicated to uh, helping graduate students get the experience of coming up with ideas, uh, writing a proposal, getting it reviewed, and then getting funding to carry out independent original research that the students came up independent of their supervisor. And I think this is really an important aspect of, of graduate studies. Often graduate students have ideas. Uh, you know, you might be at Phoenix uh, chatting with your friends or at a coffee shop chatting with your friends, coming up with interesting ideas. Oh, I wish we could do this, or if you did this, and I did this, we could put this together. And this program is meant to support that. I think that it's uh, one of a kind. I do not know of any other place that does this for graduate students. And I am really excited to not only hear about what students are going to be presenting today as a progress report. This is not a final report of uh, their research. Um, it's rather a short progress report, but I'm also excited to see this program grow uh, in the future. So three groups of students were awarded $5,000 each to uh, help offset the cost of the research project that they pitched that was awarded to them. Um, and uh, they carried out that work over the course of the summer. It's meant to continue for a year. So until around next May, when the same groups of students will come back and give a final report on what we were able to accomplish over the course of the year. But in January, we will launch the next version, the next iteration of this program, and uh, have a call for proposals from students to be funded uh, a little bit earlier to, to get their awards a little bit earlier so they can have more time to plan for the summer. And we're also planning to uh, have one undergraduate student hired to help one of the teams uh, during the course of that summer. So students get to pitch ideas, pitch ideas, um, carry out the research, supervise undergrads, all parts of this uh, new innovative program uh, geared toward grad students and geared toward uh, enhancing the engagement of graduate students to the process. So with that, I'm going to introduce the first of three groups that will give um, progress uh, uh, updates. So this is the group composed of Billy Dang, Alex Lee, uh, Deshaun Surdich, uh, Kevin Vaughn, uh, who have been working on a project entitled the Single Walled Carbon Nanotube Doped Hydro Gel Wave Guides. So please come up and uh, we'll hear from your, hear about your update. Okay. That's the point of the museum. Can we steal the blood there? Thanks, Mac. It's all working on my brother. Okay. Wait, where is there? Where is the HDMI? It used to be here. No, I do have HDMI. It used to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Try. Alrighty, well, thank you all very much for, for being here today. We're all very excited, um, ourselves and our peers, to be given the opportunity to present to you 
some of the results that we've gotten up to this point. Um, so today, our group is here to talk to you about our project, which is Carbon Nanotube Doped Hydrogel Waveguides. There we go. Wonderful. So meet our team. So on the far left, we have myself, Kevin Vaughn. Uh, we then have Alex Lee, Billy Dang, and last but not least, Dushan Shurditch. So um, Alex and Billy perform research in the Adrianov group, whereas Dushan and myself are in the Saravan and Mutu group. And we thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to come together um, using our different expertise to ultimately um, fabricate a, um, a highly conductive hydrogel waveguide. So speaking of waveguides, let's get into a little bit of background information. So waveguides were first fabricated in hard materials such as calcium genide glass, and this is typically done through conventional lithographic techniques. If I can draw your attention to the diagram uh, on the bottom left here. So this is a general design of an optical waveguide. So in the yellow, we have what's known as the core, and that is a relatively high refractive index area, which is um, contained within the cladding. And the cladding is denoted by the orange stripes here, and they are a relatively low refractive index area. So when you have an incident beam that's along the main axis of the waveguide, like this beam here, it's very easily um, essentially guided throughout the material. However, the point of a waveguide is to enhance the field of view of a material. And this is done and denoted by these dashed lines here. The one's a little bit skewed, but that's okay. Um, so essentially, this is known as the acceptance cone. And what the acceptance cone means is that when incident light is approaching on an angle within that cone, it will still be effectively guided by the waveguide. And that would look something like this. So as an incident beam is traveling into the area of high refractive index, it meets the boundary of the core and the cladding. And at that boundary, it will undergo a total internal reflection to continue propagating along the main core and ultimately be guided by the material. So optical fibers have been um, a rather popular application of optical waveguides, which are used in the telecommunications field to ultimately increase internet speeds. In the Saravanamutu group, um, we kind of sway a little bit from the conventional lithographic techniques because we like to inscribe cylindrically shaped optical waveguides. And that's very difficult to do with lithographic techniques. So we employ what we call optical self-trapping. Optical self-trapping, when you have a non-linear medium or a photopolymerizable medium, works as such. So as you irradiate the um, photopolymerizable medium, you'll start a polymerization, which causes a positive change in refractive index. Um, that positive change leads to um, a phenomenon known as self-focusing as seen in part B. When you have a balance between that self-focusing effect from the positive refractive index change with the natural divergence of light or diffraction, you're ultimately left with a self-trapped beam where the diameter of the beam at the entrance of the material is the same or equal to the diameter of the beam at the exit of the material. And we've shown this experimentally. So this is an optical waveguide that's propagating diagonally through this micrograph. And as you can see, the diameter of the beam is um, consistent. It is the same throughout the entire micrograph. And this little inset just shows how it's cylindrical in shape as that's the wave out, the waveguide output. Right, so from an industrial standpoint, waveguides and devices are typically used with con uh, components that have an optoelectronic uh, property. So one of those uh, materials is the carbon nanotube or CNTs. And CNTs are very conductive materials. In fact, they're conductive even at low percolation thresholds, which means that even at a very low weight low loading in a bulk sample, they can arrange themselves randomly to form these networks, which can carry an electrical current, right? And second of all, they're very solution processable. So you can dope different materials like films, like hydrogels, with these carbon nanotubes and you can make them conductive uh, bulk materials. But most importantly, they are near IR photoactive, which means that they have optical activity in the telecommunications bands from 1260 to 1610 nanometers, right? And as, it, as Kevin alluded to earlier, that's very important for optical fibers. So there's been a lot of effort to try to bridge carbon nanotubes with waveguides, right? Uh, for example, in one of the papers here, they have the CNT forming a junctional contact with a silicon waveguide uh, between two electrodes. And in fact, most CNT waveguide couples are on silicon chips, which are hard materials. However, the Saravanamutu group works with soft material waveguides, one of which being hydrogels. 
And if you want to make a hydrogel into a waveguide, it requires being something that is translucent or transparent to some degree. And if you wanted to make it, of course, into an optoelectronic waveguide, you need to somehow introduce the conductivity to this hydrogel. Now, it's been done before with either ionically conductive hydrogels or changing the monomer to be a conducting polymer hydrogel. However, we are most interested in doping it with either micro or nano composites in the hydrogel. So that being said, we can do this with graphene or what we work with, carbon nanotubes. In literature, we see that hydrogels can be done with multi-walled carbon nanotubes, but you can see here in this image that it is very dark and opaque, not ideal for a waveguide. But when we look at different kinds of literature, we can see that it is possible to make transparent films or thin films with carbon nanotubes that can be done. However, it hasn't been explored as a waveguide. So this is still uncharted territory in terms of soft materials. But what exactly are carbon nanotubes? I have been going on about them for a while, but I haven't quite explained them. Well, carbon nanotubes are a type of carbon allotrope, a way that carbons structure in nature. And you can see here that they are indeed like a sheet of carbons in a honeycomb structure or a honeycomb pattern that has been rolled up into a tube. They have great thermal and electrical conductivity, as I said before, but they are also very mechanically stable or have great mechanical strength and tensile strength and are very chemically stable, which is very important when you want to introduce it into a new material. And determining the type of carbon nanotube that you get, you can have two different kinds depending on the direction that it has been rolled up into. You can have either zigzag, chiral, or armchair. And if you have an armchair carbon nanotube, it's going to be metallic, whereas with chiral and zigzag, you have semiconducting. So you have about one third to two thirds of metallic to, carb or metallic to semiconducting in all commercial, uh, commercially made carbon nanotubes. So this is quite important because it will change the amount of conductivity you get from the sample depending on how much you have in either. So you can enrich it with more metallic or more semiconducting with different processing methods. If we were able to disperse these carbon nanotubes into a waveguide, we would be able to make it optoelectronic, which is our goal. Right, so as, as Alex said, uh, the ultimate goal of our collaboration is to make a soft material that's both conductive and can also behave as a waveguide, right? And hydrogels are a great candidate for that because if you look here, um, they very closely resemble different human tissues, right? So there's that mechanical compatibility there. And a lot of hydrogels are already being investigated for wearable electronics. So naturally, it's sort of a great place to start. We already have some precedents of hydrogels. So now we just have to put a waveguide in them and also make them conductive at the same time. Right, so our initial hypothesis um, in terms of combining optical waveguides in a hydrogel and carbon nanotubes um, is to essentially produce two different waveguide architectures that have carbon nanotubes evenly um, dispersed and, and uh, distributed throughout the hydrogel itself. Um, so one of those architectures, one of those waveguide architectures is a waveguide lattice. And that essentially is um, a lattice in a, oriented in a square array where you have cylindrical waveguides that propagate um, as seen in the side view here from the entrance phase to the exit phase of the material. And those cylindrical waveguides are typically on the order of a few microns, so typically 40 microns in diameter. And this is different from the single waveguide architecture, which is one rather large waveguide that again propagates from the entrance phase to the exit phase of our material. However, the di diameter of that beam is roughly on the um, scale of, of a few millimeters. And so the black dots um, that you see on these diagrams was our representation of how we would evenly distribute the carbon nanotubes throughout the hydrogel to ultimately create um, a hydrogel that's optically active and can guide light, and it's also highly conductive. So how exactly are we going to get these carbon nanotubes into the waveguide? Carbon nanotubes are hard to process as they're very fine and difficult to work with, so we need to get them into the waveguide in some way. And hydrogels are made out of aqueous solutions, but literature supports that we can do this with surfactants. Both sur single-walled and multi-walled carbon nanotubes have been incorporated into polar solvents with surfactants such as sodium dodecyl sulfate, SDS, or sodium dodecyl benzene sulfonate, SDBS. It was found that although SDS is less uh, dispersing and doesn't disperse carbon nanotubes as well into polar solvents, and because they are only singly layered over top of the carbon nanotube rather than more densely um, packed as sodium dodecyl benzene sulfonate, 
it does have less interference with the redox chemistry of the carbon nanotube. So in terms of SDBS, even though it does well disperse it, there may be some interference with the conductivity, which is what we need to explore in our experiments. But that being said, we wanted to start off with a series of dispersions in an aqueous solution. So we chose a phosphate buffer with these loadings of carbon nanotubes at 0.005 as our low, um, 0.001 as our medium concentration, and 0.002 as our high concentration of single-walled carbon nanotubes. And in both types of dispersions, we have at least one weight percent of the surfactant um, where we use SDS and SDBS. So once we have our carbon nanotubes dispersed into our phosphate buffer solution, we then implement it into our hydrogel composition. And that contains an acrylic acid monomer, as well as NN methylene bisacroamide as a crosslinker. And that's all in the presence of sodium phosphate buffer, which Alex just went over, is where we are dispersing our carbon nanotubes. We then implement ergocur 819 and camphor quinone as photo initiators to sensitize the resin to visible light. So once we have our sole mixed and ready to go, we implement it into our optical assembly as seen here. So we have a blue LED launching 445 nanometer light in the Z direction, and that passes through a collimating lens and then interacts with the 2D periodic amplitude mask. So this mask, I like to think about it as splitting the broad beam up into a square array of smaller beams that are about 40 microns in diameter and spaced apart by 80 microns in all directions, forming a square array. And those little beams are actually the ones that interact with our hydrogel sole. And so the same light that's being used to polymerize our sample is subsequently captured by a charge coupled device camera. So that CCD camera is capturing the output of those waveguides forming, allowing, allowing us to perform temporal evolutions of how those waveguides are forming. And so here on the left, we have a temporal evolution of waveguide lattice formation um, image using a CCD camera. And so what is actually a CCD image? Uh, so referring back to the setup that Kevin just explained, our CCD camera is located here and it is imaging the exit face of our sample or the light as it exits the sample. And so um, through the CCD camera or charge couple device is responsible for taking the light signal it receives and converting it to electrical signal, which we then process into uh, an intensity profile as seen here, which uh, we then use to analyze our data. And so we use an inferno color map, which has yellow as the brightest intensity. And so what do we do with our CCD camera to monitor the experiment? So we have it set up to monitor the exit phase and the entrance phase. So this is how the entrance phase would look like for the lattice wave guide formation. And so how do we know when our experiment would be over? So here we have the monitoring of the exit phase on the left side. And so you see at four seconds, vertical stripes indicating that the wave guides have not been formed yet. However, at six seconds, we see the wave by formation is intact, meaning that the experiment is completed or uh, is near completion. And so how do we know that these, uh, so another way to look at our sample is through a microscope. And so this is a polymerization reaction is irreversible, meaning that these structures are permanently inscribed. We can look at them through a microscope. And so here we have uh, further evidence of our wave by being formed. And so moving on to samples that have been doped with uh, carbon nanotube concentrations, starting off at the lowest concentrations, so 0 0.05, 0.0005 weight percentage, we see that our wave by lattice is mostly intact and the carbon nanotubes are scattered throughout the sample. However, moving uh, to 0.001 weight percentage, we see that these carbon nanotubes begin to disrupt the formation of wave by lattice, meaning that the carbon nanotubes are affecting the process of the wave by lattice formation. And moving to the highest concentration that we used, we can see that the waveguides, uh, the lattice is not forming well at all, and the carbon nanotubes are highly disrupting the formation of this waveguide lattice. And so seeing that we had difficulties uh, using the waveguide lattice formation with the carbon nanotubes in our samples, we decided, we decided to then move on to single waveguides formation. And so the setup is very similar for these, except for the mask here that you see. So instead of using the amplitude mask that was seen in Kevin's setup that he was discussing as well, uh, we now use a shape determining mask that is cylindrical. So the circle is approximately um, five millimeters in diameter and is responsible for the formation of the single waveguide. And so what does this look like at the entrance space? So we're imaging the center of the beam here. So it just appears as a broad beam and moving to the edge. So this now looks like, look like, look like at the edge of the uh, single waveguide. 
And so for our experiments, we'll be looking at the exit face at the center of the beam. And so here we also have an example of how it would look like in just a regular hydrogel experiment. And here's a formation of the singular waveguide after radiation. Uh, just note that the vinyl mask has been shifted a bit and that the um, unpolymerized, cell has, unpolymerized cell has been removed in the sample as well. And so looking at the first temporal evolution of the lowest carbon nanotube uh, weight percentage, we see these areas of higher intensity appearing at two seconds. And this is um, indicative that these areas are of higher effective index as well. But to confirm the presence of waveguides, we'd have to look at this sample under a microscope. And then so we move towards six seconds and see some initial phase separation begin to occur, which then becomes more prominent at eight and 10 seconds. So we decided to do another trial at the lowest um, weight percentage. And again, we observe these areas of greater intensity appearing with less uh, prominent phase separation, but we still saw those in our sample. And then at 0.002% uh, uh, carbon nanotubes, we saw, again, complete disruption of any waveguide formation. And also note the long polymerization times, indicating that the carbon nanotubes really disrupt the general uh, polymerization process as well. And so to conclude, between the two surfactants that we tested, we chose to move forward with SDBS as this surfactant provided uh, more transparent solutions as well as uh, higher quality waveguide lattices in our experiments. And then, so speaking of the waveguide lattice experiments, we found that the lowest concentration provided us with the best results with the most intact waveguide lattices. And then moving away from the waveguide lattice to the single waveguide, we saw interesting results in that we were, we were able to form um, areas of greater intensity, but we need to be uh, we need to be doing more to optimize these experiments. To, and uh... right, and optimizing uh, these hydrogel formulations is what we're primarily concerned with now. So, as Dushan alluded to earlier, we do see massive CNT aggregation across the sample and throughout, and which lead to local aberrations. Right, so you're seeing that massive phase separation. You're seeing, you know solvent exclusion from the actual bulk sample itself. But by adjusting that monomer to CNT ratios and the relative concentrations in the hydrogel, and also by changing the hydrogel dimensions, right, by using different masks, hopefully we can achieve a uniform dispersion of these CNTs throughout the sample so that we can have no aggregation and a transparent hydrogel that can form a waveguide in the middle. And if that is successful, obviously we want to look at if the bulk sample is conductive or not. And we can just use a multimeter uh, hooked up to a four probe system. So this scheme will show you that there are four electrodes attached to the hydrogel on both sides, applying a uniform current. And then the sensing electrodes in blue will detect the voltage across the sample. And uh, in exciting news, we are getting in November a peak tuna tunneling atomic force microscopy or AFM. So, or microscope or AFM. And this accessory will allow us to basically map out the surface topology uh, of the hydrogel and also correlate it with areas of high uh, conductance, right? So we can actually see the carbon nanotube network dispersed in the hydrogel, right? And the high current area is yellow and low is blue. So we're hoping to see results that look like this. And with that, I want to thank McMaster University and BIMR for allowing this collaboration to happen. I want to thank members of the Adrenoff group and Saravana Muti group and Alex and Kala for supporting us. And last but not least, thank you all for listening. We don't have too much time for questions, but if there are any questions, uh, you can Do you have any suggestions for like to optimize that hydrogel? Um, essentially, we just need to find a way to disperse the nanotubes within our gel where we have enough transparency to form waveguides, where we still have the ability to have the nanotubes in a concentration where it will affect the conductivity. Um, so we've been thinking of a couple ways. One way is more of an, from an engineering standpoint. So um, we were thinking of maybe just creating a waveguide and finding a way to coat outside with uh, nanotubes so that we don't have to disrupt the waveguide formation, but that's um, still very much in the early works. Okay, I forgot to mention that we will have a reception just outside this room immediately following the talk. So there will be time to interact with the groups and have uh, discussions or suggestions or any further questions can be asked then. 
Um, with that, please join me in thanking our first group for a great talk. Okay, the second uh, update for today, this afternoon, um, from um, Sharifu Saki and Alzheimer Nervo, uh, and telling us about their work on using correlative light and left on microscopy to investigate the influence of genetic modifications on the quantity and quality of the crystals. So, hello everyone, I'm Alice Samga and this is Sharifu. And today we're going to present you about the updates on our project regarding a correlative light electron microscopy technique to characterize the magnetite crystals produced by a bacteria, a magnetotactic bacteria, that synthesizes them, that synthesizes them spontaneously when we apply a genetic modification to this bacteria. Okay, so first a quick introduction into this uh, species. So uh, uh, this species of bacteria was first discovered in 1963 by Salvatore Buini, and this specific strain, uh, they live in fresh water. And as you can see from this image, they're all aligned in one direction, and they actually swim uh, all in uh, one direction if you apply them, uh, if you subject them to an external magnetic field. Now, how do they do this? Well, uh, yeah, I guess uh, this is a video, but it's not working, that's fine. Uh, so how do they do this? They have a chain of magnetosomes all of, along their cell body. But what is a magnetosome? It's, you can think of it like a bacterial organ. And in this case, it encapsulates a magnetite nanocrystal. These crystals are of the composition of uh, ferrous ferric oxide and they're cuboctahedral in shape. They have a very narrow uh, uniform size distribution, making them uh, very much suitable for uh, many applications. Uh, so there are many proteins that uh, uh, come into play here to make these uh, crystals, and this is something that we're really interested in studying. So uh, the applications that I was talking about, because of this uh, biological phenomenon, uh, some of them include the ability to use them as biosensors to sense contaminants in water to clean up heavy metals from water. Uh, you can even use them as contrasting agents in MRI. You can even use them to heat kill tumor cells. And most excitingly, they're going to be used later this year or early next year in a hospital in Montreal uh, to inject live bacterial cells into uh, patients to then target cancer cells uh, to deliver drugs to uh, those cells to kill them. So, uh, a quick uh, summary of what a protein is, it's like the workhorse of any organism. They carry out the most functions in our bodies. They're the things that get uh, the most jobs done. So in this case, uh, we're focusing on MMS6. This protein is involved in the nucleation or the creation of this crystal. And so uh, they influence the crystal size, shape, and overall morphology. So if we can uh, control how much of this protein we're producing, we should be able to uh, con control the qualities of this crystal. So our plan is to introduce genetic modifications to this bacteria so that we will have fluorescently tagged MMS6 protein. This will allow us to then uh, analyze the localization of uh, these magnetosomes and quantify them. And we're going to use novel in-situ imaging techniques uh, to then characterize these crystals. So I'm going to give a very brief overview of the initial stages of our project. It's very heavy in molecular biology. So I uh, encourage you to ask questions at the end if you have any. Uh, so the first step is to simply just uh, extract this DNA blueprint from their body. The uh, DNA is like a blueprint for making proteins and these proteins carry out functions. So we need the blueprint for MMS6. So essentially we break these cells and uh, then we extract their DNA. And th the next step is to then uh, take this, uh, this DNA and we, we don't want all of it. We just want the, the part that has the MMS6 blueprint. 
And so we're going to use a technique that we're all very much familiar with by now, which is PCR, uh, to copy out the MMS6 blueprint into a usable amount. Then we're going to use a circular piece of DNA. Uh, this is important because bacteria will express any gene uh, that is in the circular piece of DNA. Next, we're going to couple it with an amnion green gene. That way we can do, uh, we can characterize, uh, we can see the localization of this protein. We can quantify it later on uh, when we actually do the imaging. So once we assemble this construct, we can then transport it into a strain of E. coli called E. coli top 10. Uh, this strain, you can think of it as kind of like a USB. It stores your genetic data, and it can even act as a photocopier to make more of it. Then we can transfer it into another strain called E. coli MFD peer. This strain, you can think of it kind of like a mailing service. It specializes in uh, sending the genetic data from itself into other uh, bacterial species, and that's called conjugation. Once we have all of these steps completed, we'll finally have fluorescently tagged MMS6 uh, in our genetically modified AMV1. So a quick rundown of our results. A quick reminder of the first step, we're simply just uh, isolating the DNA from the bacteria. And uh, what you're seeing here is the result of a gel electrophoresis. Um, what this technique does is it essentially separates large pieces of DNA from smaller pieces of DNA. Uh, these numbers here on the side is like a, a DNA ruler. It helps us estimate how large our uh, uh, DNA fragments are. And in this case, our fragments are very much intact. They're a very sharp rectangle and uh, they're very bright. We used another uh, instrument called a nanodrop to test the purity of our uh, DNA. And we were able to obtain highly pure and highly intact DNA for downstream applications like PCR uh, to PCR out the MMS6 gene. Uh, the next step is to uh, try and assemble the plasmid, and we were focusing on uh, inserting this uh, amnion green fragment into the circular DNA. And uh, what this uh, gel essentially tells us, this pattern suggests that we were successful in obtaining uh, this circular construct. However, the second uh, diagnostic has very faint bands. What that means is our starting material was uh, too low, so we need to increase this material to have success in actually uh, transforming the E. coli and working with the E. coli. So the, the obvious um, method to do that is to PCR amplify it, to photocopy it, to make more of it. Um, however, uh, this construct is very large and that proved to be very difficult. So we have an alternative method is to simply use nature to our advantage. We can simply uh, use the E. coli to make more of that circular construct. And uh, we need to use an enzyme to cut this E. coli so that we can then uh, insert that uh, amnion green gene uh, into our circular construct. So what this uh, gel shows us is that we were able to isolate uh, a large number of that circular DNA for use with, uh, for ligating this uh, amnion green into the uh, plasma for further uh, uh, work with E. coli. So while we're busy uh, making that circular DNA, we can then use another piece of circular DNA that already has a fluorescent gene, EGFP, uh, to then test out and validate the uh, steps involving the E. coli and to make sure that we can actually uh, measure fluorescence. So uh, we took that circular DNA with EGFP and we transformed E. coli top 10, which is once again, uh, kind of like a USB strain. You can store your DNA and you can multiply it. And here you can see very nice fluorescence uh, as a result of the bacteria expressing that gene uh, when shown under blue light. So then we take that circular DNA and we moved it into uh, E. coli MFD peer. And uh, what's important to note is this circular DNA confers the bacteria with antibiotic resistance. That's the only way that they can grow on this plate is, that, is if they successfully take up this uh, circular DNA. And then once we have this, we can isolate a colony on this plate, we can grow it, and then uh, grow them in the presence back into our organism of interest, AMB1, which is what's happening on this plate. Uh, this is essentially the process that's occurring. Uh, it's transferring the circular DNA into AMB1. Uh, which we can then finally have fluorescently tagged AMB1. Uh, and uh, while we're working on this, we're also working on uh, incorporating the MMS6 gene into this construct. So eventually, uh, the next step is to then have uh, fluorescently tagged MMS6 
for us to do imaging and analysis. So as Sharifu mentioned, what we aim to get at the end from this process is actually a bacteria that expresses this gene and does have a magnetosome and it's genetically modified. And at the same time, have a fluorescent tag, the fluorescent tag we need for the correlative microscopy uh, in order to be able to localize this magnetosome and make sure that we're actually picking magnetosomes that present this genetic modification. So how, what are we using to characterize these magnetosomes? We're, we're using two techniques, so a light microscopy technique and an electron microscopy technique. The first one we're going to use is a fluorescence-based microscopy. So these bacteria have already been imaged through, my, through fluorescence microscopy, generally using a confocal microscope, which has a resolution of around 250 nanometers. And that would not allow us to be able to perfectly localize the fluorescence on the magnetosome of interest. Why actually we want to know where the, the modification is so that we are sure that we are looking at a magnetosome Magnetosome that was genetically modified so that we can tell what happens to the magnetite crystal synthesized. So in this case, we're using alphanumeric grids so that the coordinates that we obtain using uh, structured illumination microscopy, we can reconnect to the coordinates during TEM, so transmission electron microscopy wide structured illumination, because in this case, the resolution is much higher. We arrive around 80 nanometers, which is enough in order to be able to localize our magnetosomes. Thus, through the uh, alphanumeric grid, we're going to use the same sample as for uh, transmission electron microscopy. And for transmission electron microscopy, we have three different goals of increasing difficulty. So the first one is a normal bright field TEM, where our aim is to characterize what changed with the gene ge genetic modification in the synthesis of uh, our uh, crystals. So what changed in the, in the size, in the number, in the shape, or in the crystalline structure. The second one is actually going to be about tomography. So we're going to try to reconstruct the 3D shape of our crystals and see if there is a preferential plane of growth, um, uh, depending on which are the interactions with the modified proteins. And finally, uh, we're going to use a wet imaging technique. So these bacteria have been um, looked in a wet conditions, but generally using specific TEM holders that are um, realized for that specific goal. In this case, we actually are going to use a different technique, which is a um, sandwiching technique that was developed at Penn State University, uh, where our solution of bacteria is actually sandwiched between the TEM grid and the um, silicon nitride chip, which allows to in investigate what the bacteria looks like in reality, because there's no need for fixation in this case. So it's actually what the bacteria actually looks like in practice. So for now, we've started with our negative controls. So these are TEM images of our bacteria that have not been stained and do not present any kind of fluorescence or genetic modification. These are just meant for us to understand in a normal condition while analyzing the bacteria, what's the average size of the bacteria itself and of the synthesized nanoparticles. And we're trying to understand what's the best imaging processing that we can use in order to address all of the modifications that we're interested in checking out. Um, the, two, the, the relevant thing is that we're checking for both the log phase and the stationary phase. There are two different phases in the growth of the bacteria. Uh, just to check if there may be any kind of difference in how the crystals are synthesized during these two different phases. With that, we're happy to take any questions if you guys have any, or if you're in a rush, we can also answer them later during um, the outside meeting. We would like to thank the IMR for giving us the chance to collaborate on this project. Uh, our supervisors, of course, so Professor Granfield, Professor Sask, and Professor Fadim. Um, the CCM and all their technicians for the help provided, call, especially Joao for all of the precious information and suggestions about the strategy for the light microscopy, and my colleague Lizzie Cecco for the help provided during the TEM sessions. With that, I thank you all for listening.
questions? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. You said that you're going to use the percentage microscopy. Uh, and to my knowledge, the main drawback of getting microscopy is a question. So, how do you expect to see a question problem? And so, how are you going to deal with it? Yeah. Uh, so, essentially, um, we're using Mneon Green, which is really good at uh, maintaining the fluorescence. Like, it's three times brighter than EGFP. It, uh, uh, decays much slower. Uh, so the the nice thing is that the bacteria it actually produces it constantly. Uh, so uh, there's a constant stream of uh, the fluorescent protein. Um, if 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 we could get the video working, you could see like uh, it, it constantly uh, keeps the maintains fluorescence. It doesn't uh, photo beach too much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah one more. So thanks. I think that like so the copies that you made with the transform bacteria did you want to over express over express the MF six sixteen it wasn't successful but if it is successful obviously um, you can keep on trying what do you think the results on the crystals is the magnetite crystals like oh, by over expressing that gene uh, it can increase the quantity of the crystals like uh you'd see more crystals along the chain you would see them uh, if there were any irregularities in the wild type they would become more uniform. Um, because that's what the amino six is responsible for. It uh, it facilitates the uh, the, the it, it facilitates the initial stages of the crystal growth so that it it be, uh, uh, grows to be more uniform. Any structure related? So it could be the planes of growth that oh. we are expecting to see a change on. So this protein is what determines how the synthesis is gonna happen. So if we can control how much of this protein is present, we can see if there's any connection with, as I was mentioning, the size, the number, um, the planes of growth. Thank you. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you're just trying to see what is the effect of that gene on, but you're not targeting a particular, result of higher number or larger size or smaller size? It could be higher number. Uh, we're hoping to maintain, so it should still be a monocrystal, so that's pretty, pretty known. The size could change, but actually we're trying to address that after gen genetic modification. So. Okay. Great, she's joining, thank you. Hey, third group for this afternoon um, is composed of Joseph Manisano and Rick Trico from uh, the control and areas groups, and they will be telling us about their work on establishing structural buoyancy of blood, blood brain barrier permeable systems. <laughs> I'm trying not to be present to you at mobile. Really? Can you see? No, um, Do we have to stay in this area to be captured on Zoom? No, I can go anywhere? Okay, cool. Okay, so I guess... Uh, Thanks for making it to the last talk. Uh, so it's going to be presented by me and Rick. Uh, I'm from the Bujold lab. Uh, as uh, Dr. Adrian said, Rick is from the AIRS lab. And we're going to be talking about establishing structural dependency of BBB permeable systems. So let's talk a little bit about what the BBB is. So the BBB, our blood brain barrier, has evolved to keep a, you know toxic pathogens and substances out from accessing our brain. So this becomes a little bit of an issue when we're trying to deliver, uh, deliver drugs to the brain. Um, so what our lab focuses on are oligonucleotides. So in the last presentation, we talked about how you know DNA is kind of like a blueprint for encoding proteins. Well, what we do is we use oligonucleotides, which are short synthetic uh, oligomers, so nucleic acid oligomers for drug delivery purposes. Um, and they have all these interesting property, uh, properties. So they're water soluble, programmable. We can uh, insert any nitrogenous base that we want. So they interact really strongly through hydrogen bonding with their target. So we can target DNA, complementary DNA, complementary RNA, and silence expression and protein expression of these genes. And I'll point out one thing. 
standard DNA has this typical fossil diester backbone, which is neg negatively charged and hydrophilic, which most of you probably know. So um, to overcome some of the challenges with um, drug delivery, what a lot of people have done is add chemical modifications to oligonucleotides. So backbone modifications have been introduced, um, nucleobase modifications, ribose modifications in, with respect to RNA, uh, two prime hydroxyl modifications have been introduced, as well as alternative types of chemistry. So like peptide nucleic acids, lock nucleic acids, et cetera. So as I highlighted before, that phosphate backbone, we believe is the main driver of the physiological properties of DNA. Um, and so that we propose that, you know, alternating this or introducing new chemistries about the phosphate backbone is going to give us um, the best output when we want to when we when we chemically modify them, so we believe that because it's the most physiologically relevant uh, feature, modifying this is going to be the most helpful in terms of uh, having new properties um, for these drugs. So on top of these are linear linear oligonucleotides, we can also functionalize them into these nanostructured systems, um, which consist of densely functionalizing a nanoparticle core. So whether it be gold, liposomes, uh, etc., any nanoparticle of your choosing. Um, and the interesting about this is that at the nanoscale, you know, we have different properties that are independent of the nanoparticle core. I'll also mention here that with a lot of uh, drugs when delivering them to the brain, they have to be administered in really evasive ways. So intrathecally or intracerebral ventricularly, um, which, which is why we like to chemically modify them. So maybe we can make um, administration e easier, maybe orally, systemically or intranasally. So I'm going to talk a little bit of how we actually get these specific modifications on. I won't walk you through the whole synthesis. I'll only cover the most important part of functionalizing these oligonucleotide backbones. So we do it through this cycle. Um, we have these hydrogen phosphonate nucleoside derivative building blocks. Just worry about this structure and this structure. So we have these building blocks um, in which we can do this oxidative amination. Now, that's probably uncommon for anyone who's done any organic chemistry. Um, but what it allows us to do is incorporate these intranucleotide um, backbone modifications. And we do this all in an automated fashion on this instrument. It's a, a oligonucleotide synthesizer. And typically, this allows you to synthesize DNA in a programmable ma matter. So ATCG, ATCG. But what we do is we're going to hijack it so we can make this chemistry compatible on the synthesizer. It allows us to reduce the time and cost associated with synthesizing these structures, as well as we can run them in parallel synthesis as well. So I'm just going to highlight that main uh, point again, um, and we can take away two points from this slide. We have this hydrogen phosphonate and conducted in basic conditions with an oxidizing reagent. We can form a PN bond as opposed to the standard PO. So this does two things. One, we get a PO bond or a PN bond, which um, kind of neutralizes the charge of that PO backbone. And when we neutralize the charge, we know uh, typically when we have you know cationic or anionic structure, they repel cell membranes. Uh, they're not very electrostatically favorable. So by introducing a PN bond, we kind of reduce this partial charge as well as we can introduce an R group of our choosing. So some functionality that's responsible for uptake. So let's talk about a little bit of characterization of these linear oligonucleotides first off. So when we purify them, we use reverse phase HPLC. And something interesting happened here is that when we increase the number of modifications and the modification of our choosing, we just chose a generic modification like propylamine. When we add, when we have an unmodified strand, a strand with three modifications, seven and 10, we can see a gradual retention time in the column. And it makes sense because we're doing a reverse phase HPLC, which has a um, hydrophobic stationary phase. So the more hydrophobic groups we add in, the longer it's going to retain with the column. Um, as well as we can characterize these uh, oligonucleotides based on gels, um, which tell us things about their mass as well as their uh, relative charge. So when we increase the number of modifications on these structures, um, in essence, we're reducing the overall charge, which is shown with the reduced uh, electrophoretic mobility on this gel. So from this slide, I think uh, we can take away, um, the main point is that we can take away that the structure, so the chemical modifications that we introduce to the structure dictate some of the properties it has. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to talk about how we can take these oligonucleotides. Uh, I'm just going to denote them with this squiggly little line uh, with this purple region and a thiol, and how we can bioconjugate these with gold nanoparticles. So we do this through a, a thiol gold covalent bond, and we can form these spherical nucleic acids. So I just um, I just drew this region with these, these purple 
purple shell to show like which regions were going to be modified. So we we put the important functional groups on the surface because you know when they interact with cells or cell membranes, this is going to be the primary responsible um, uh, functional group for interaction. And we can characterize these uh, with agarose gels. So these are this is quite a nice scale. It shows like very monodispersed bands. So it means that our spherical nucleic acids are monodispersed and not aggregating. And as well as gels, we can use DLS to determine their hydrodynamic radius. So DLS is just a technique where we can shoot light at nanoparticles. And based on the way they reflect, let, refract light, um, we can gather information about their hydrodynamic radius. So for these SNAs, we have an unmodified SNA, a 3X uh, propylamine modified SNA, and a 7X. They all have relatively the same hydrodynamic radius when we compare them with a control of just gold nanoparticle stocks. So this is just proof that these types of chemistries that we have are compatible uh, with nanostructured systems. Um, and we believe that, you know, introducing these chemical modifications to linear oligonucleotides and nanostructured system are going to um, alter their properties and therefore dictate their interactions with the BBB. And having said that, I'll pass it on to Rick to discuss more of this. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know I'm the last one for the day, so we'll try to keep it as succinct and as easy to do just as possible. And as John mentioned, uh, my main goal for today is to convince you that there is a dependency between structure of the drug and the BBB permeability. And I'm going to do this through introducing you a concept from computer science, which is called metric learning. So for now, I'll ask you to forget a little bit about BBB permeability and just, just follow me. So in computer science, in machine learning community, we believe that if points are close together or if they have a similar features, then they're going to have a similar tar target property. And for the sake of visualization, I created a data set of points where our thing we're trying to predict our target property is actually the color of the point, okay? So again, we believe if point, points are close together, then they're gonna have a similar color. And well, for humans, for us, it's obvious that color is distributed along X direction. However, if we take a look at the neighborhood graph, so it means that I connected every point with the closest point in the neighborhood, then we see that, let's take a look at this pair of of points. Uh, if I don't know the color of the black point, I find the closest one, which is purple, so I'm going to misclassify it as a purple. In fact, all points in here are going to be misclassified except this yellow one. But again, this is super trivial case for, for us as humans, so how, how we deal with it. Um, there where is metric learning comes in play. So in general, a uh, metric such as a Euclidean metric distance uh, is a so-called isotropic distances, which means uh, sorry, isotropic metrics, which means we treat distance in every direction equally. However, there is other sort of metrics, such as Mahalanobis metric, where distance in every direction is treated differently. So instead of living in a circle or sphere of equal distances, we live in, a, uh, in, a, in an ellipse. So that means that in this case, instead of counting uh, neighborhood in all directions equally, we treat a neighborhood in x direction more than neighborhood in one direction. So this actually means that we can classify all points correctly, which is well win. Uh, so what does it mean? If after applying metric learning to our problem, uh, and it, we increase accuracy of prediction, whatever property we're trying to predict, that means there's basically a useful features information, such as x direction in this case, and there's basically a noise or useless information about our system that we probably doesn't have to take into account, such as y direction in this case. Okay, so let's hop in back to BBB permeability. So for testing this hypothesis, we, we are working with B3DB data set, which was curated by Dr. Fenman Mann from our group. Um, so the data set is curated from 50 published experimental sources of small drugs. And you can see the distribution, uh, by distribution of these drugs and this average weight is slightly more than 400 deltons, which is again, well, super small drugs. Um, the good thing about it, we have more than 7,000 instances of experimental values of BBB permeable drugs, which we denoted as BBB plus, and BBB non permeable drugs, which we denoted as BBB minus. Um, this data set is pretty well balanced. However, it's not the case in real life because we know that 98% of drugs are not BBB permeable. Uh, but again, for the sake of numerical stability and in general, well, it's better to have a well-balanced data set, even though it's not a case in real life. Uh, the best thing about the data set is there is more than 1,000 experimental values of log BB values. That means that we not only could say that drugs are permeable or not permeable, but how permeable it is. So we can make not only quantity, but also quality predictions at the same time, which is, which is a good thing to have. 
Uh, okay, so we represent our molecule as a as a uh, well so-called paddle descriptor. So this is standard chemo informatical descriptor that takes into, into account all possible information about the structure of the drug, and it represented as a number of let's say number of aromatic atoms, bonds, uh, number of all bonds, uh, number of rings, hydrogen acceptors, donuts, and so on and so forth. Again, there are more than two thousand descriptors that generated just through all possible information about the structure of the drug. So after applying this idea of, well, key nearest neighbors that I told before that if uh, drugs have similar set of features, then they're gonna have a similar permeability. We can predict uh, permeability of the drug with the accuracy of more than 85%, which is already great. However, after applying this uh, approach of metric that I told before, we can gain our, our accuracy up to 88%. So what does it mean? Uh, there are two, key points in here. And the first one is, well, if we can predict permeability with a decent accuracy, just taking into account only structural information about the drug, then there is a clear link between structure of the drug and its VB permeability. And the second one, which is even better, that if we apply metric learning and we increase accuracy, then there is a specific set of features uh, such as we don't know yet, maybe it's number of hydrogen bond, number of hydrogen bond acceptors or donors or aromatic rings, so there's something in a combination that carries more information about the BBB permeability than some other things, probably number of carbon atoms, that basically doesn't you know, give us any extra information about permeability and just annoys that we well, have it just because we're trying to keep as much information as possible. So the next natural step of this project is actually identifies these key features that carries the most amount of information about BB permeability, um, checks the impact on log BB, which means not only say, okay, uh, increasing number of hydrogen bonds makes uh, drugs permeable, but let's say increasing them by two gonna increase permeability four times, right? Uh, so this is gonna save Joe a lot of time and money because instead of looking through all possible combinations of uh, drugs and functional group substitution, I can provide him, let's say, with five to ten the most promising, um, the most promising modifications, and going to increase uh, permeability. And on top of this, I well, hopefully, could even say the number of modifications that should be done to a specific drug to make it from non-permeable to permeable. And so far, that's what we have. Thanks a lot for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So I saw a great talk, um, it was really great, really interesting. Um, but my one question for you is, so you're using this metric learning to be able to tell how many different changes you can make and what to like BB permeability, but you did mention that there is a discrepancy in how accurate that is. How would you fix that discrepancy? Because you mentioned that a lot of the times it will stay permanent, but it's not actually in your body. Oh, well, you can answer that part and then I can answer from the experimental side. Okay, yeah. So uh, again, the, the, the key point of this specific presentation uh, was not about introducing the functional group that is responsible for permeability, but to make sure that there is a link between structure of the drug and permeability, because otherwise there is no point of doing any sort of modifications. And we did it through, again, metric learning, as you uh, mentioned. So what we find out that there, we don't need to take into account all these 2000 descriptors, such as in carbon atoms, hydrogen, and so forth, but we should take, we should consider number of hydrogen bonds, uh, donors, for example, right? And with, with well, we will figure out it later, what, what, how responsible they are. So we can have it take a drug, make the specific modifications that increase, let's say number of, uh, I don't know, carbon rings, aromatic rings that potentially gonna increase permeability of the drug, and then, well, actually make it permeable drugs from a non-permeable one, yeah, so if that was a question. Yeah, so you could slide that with me. And then basically, based on those functional groups that we think uh, would be more BBB permeable, I'd assemble you know, a small library instead of this massive, gigantic library, uh, lots of expenditures. And I would test it in a BBB model. So I, I, I'm, I would, I'm part of our proposal is that eventually I'm gonna be developing a BBB model after we um, formulate all these SNAs and a linear oligonucleotides with, with whatever backbone modifications we find most relevant, we'll test them in the system. We'll see their relative BBB permeability, um, perm relative BBB permeability, and then we can supplement uh, the model as well with those values. 
to the permeability of the EDD model and how accurate it is in terms of humans and how well it translates, how would you be able to see how well that would translate to humans? Like, how are you going, how are you planning on making the model um, as accurate as possible and translate to that? Yeah, sure. So basically, we're looking for the most accurate models, like the most recent models. We have a couple of models. So it consists of layering three different types of cells that encompass the BBB, around the BBB. So we'll be doing those. But if you want real, real, real values like that, you're going to have to move like most models or something like that. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, we test. I mean, we not presented it yet, but we already tested a couple of other models. Uh, so so far, HG Boost three works the best. Uh, neural networks also do the job, but the problem with neural networks is a so-called black box model. So it's really hard to unpack it. Uh, but HG Boost is well. I mean, we we come up with a clever trick, so we'll keep you posted next presentation how to actually unpack this black box model. Uh, but so far, HG Boost. Uh, classifier in this case gives the best results of 92% of accuracy prediction. So again, the main task is here is to find out what, what classifier treat to be the best features. No ones. Okay, with that, let's, uh, let's finish. Please join me in thanking Joe and Rick and all of the speakers. Thank you all for